Good morning. This is Betsy Stites, and I am the president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove Area League of Women Voters. I am so glad to invite you all to sit back and really um, listen to our wonderful legislators as we, as we have our annual legislative interviews. This is probably one of our most popular and well-attended events because it's really critical to really begin to understand more about what might be coming up at the legislative session. We have two wonderful uh, facilitators and our legislators are going to be all ready to jump in with their perspectives on the upcoming session. I just always at these uh, want to reinforce our nonpartisan focus. The league is nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing <laughs> candidates or political parties at any level of government. But we are always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. And this legislative session is one of the main ways that we can do that. We really envision a democracy where every person has a desire, the right, the knowledge and the information and confidence to participate. And so I'm going to turn it over to Vivian Tannehill, who is our advocacy director, and Jody, um, who is going to, um, she's our communication uh, director. She and Vivian are going to be our two facilitators. So Vivian, take it away. Thank you, Betsy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vivian Latimer Tannehill, and I'm one of the moderators today. I would like to provide an overview of this morning's program. We will begin with moderator-led questions developed by the League of Women Voters Minnesota and the Woodbury Cottage Grove Area Legislative Interview Committee. Legislators will have one minute to answer each question and 30 seconds for follow-up comments. This will be followed by questions submitted by the audience via our web website. Uh, next, we will have our legislators um, provide a one minute, very brief summary statement of what they would like our audience to leave with today. And we will close with an announcement by our candidate forums chair, Linda Walling, and remarks by our league president, Betsy Stites. Because audience questions were submitted in advance, Q&A will not be available during this program. If you would like to submit comments, please send them to the advocacy on the League of Women Voters Woodbury Cottage Grove area website. Now I would like to hand it over to our co-moderator, Jody Ritaka. Jody, thank you. thank you so much, Vivian, and good morning, everyone. Glad you could be here and excited to be a part of this. So thank you, what an honor. Uh, we begin, we'll get right into our first question. So what are your top three policy priorities for the legislative session? Please be as specific as possible as to why these are your priorities and what legislation you plan to support. And we'll be asking you about bonding in just a moment. So that is our first question. And we begin with Senator Kent. Good morning, Jody and everyone. It's good to see you. Um, uh, thanks for this. It's always great to be with everyone, even if we can't do it in person. Um, my top three priorities, and it's always hard to pick, it's like picking your kids, you know, but I have to say that my first uh, priority, so I only had one, um, the, uh, my first priority uh, personally is paid family and medical leave. That's an issue that I have uh, supported all the way through. Um, I've carried this bill now, it'll be my sixth year. And what we've really seen brought home so clearly during the pandemic is that families need that support and that time. So they don't have to choose between a paycheck and either taking care of a family member, a new baby or them, their, themselves. Um, I'm also deeply concerned about election issues. Um, uh, redistricting, I know we'll be talking about, that'll be obviously front and center in the next month or so. Um, but as we look ahead towards the November election, it's so important. And I have some local issues and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Thanks. Well, thank you, Susan. And next, uh, Representative Sandell. 
Thanks very much, uh, Jody. I have um, a number of bills that I'm carrying personally that I feel strongly about. The first is a school-based health centers. It's been an issue that I've uh, been concerned about and advocated for since uh, teaching school. There's no nothing more fundamental um, uh, in a child's uh, success and, and achievement and in a family's uh, um, uh, organization and support than uh, uh, their health and well-being. The second one is strengthening the 1989 Groundwater Protection Act. Uh, it's good legislation, but uh, the agencies that are responsible to protect the groundwater just haven't had the the tools to uh, do that efficiently. And since 1989, uh, as you know, the um, um, work has become um, more demanding, as well as environmental review process, which I believe uh, should be strengthened as well. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Next, we go to Senator Bigham. Thank you. First, thanks for uh, having us here, putting this together. I always enjoy this uh, opportunity. I think the top priorities for me, uh, first and foremost, are safe communities. Uh, it's something over the last 20 years I have worked on when first uh, at the ripe old age of 22 or 23, I was appointed to the Public Safety, Health and Welfare Commission in Cottage Grove, and I've never looked back on this issue, uh, daughter and sister of firefighters. So, um, uh, we need to look at retention, recruitment, investing in preventative and community policing. We need to um, really focus on how we're working with juvenile justice system. Um, we, but most importantly, everybody deserves to feel safe no matter what your zip code is. And people need to be held accountable for, for the crimes that are being committed. So uh, we have to kind of work from there. The other thing I will say, oh, 10 seconds. Uh, I would look at uh, some tax cuts and tax reform and also clean water uh, legislation and sports wagering right at the buzzer. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Carla. Moving on to Representative Jurgen. Thank you, Jody. Pleasure, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, the top bill priority that I'll have this year is pushing my bill um, that would eliminate state income taxes on all Social Security income. Uh, I think that this is the year we hopefully we can finally get that done. Uh, budget wise, the budget's done. We don't, you know, this, we could we could go into session and, and adjourn the same day and the state would continue to function. Not that I think that that's going to happen, um, but we but we could do that. Uh, and of course, it's a, a bonding year um, with the budget surplus. Uh, there would, should be some cash spending rather than borrowing. So how we work that out, that'll probably take uh, uh, the majority of the legislative session to get there. But um, those are the things you can expect to, to hear about throughout the session this year. Um, and Carla mentioned it too, the public safety uh, crime is, is rampant in the metro area. And that's something that we need to deal with to give police uh, better tools to do their job. All right, thanks, Tony. And um, next to Representative Shong. Jody, I just saw an email from two. He's having trouble with the link. I just um, let Vivian know. So, okay. Well, what, why don't we? We'll come back to him for that first question, but we'll uh, we'll toss it to the second question to Vivian to ask. Thank you, Jody. Um, what are your hopes for this bonding session, and are there any specific projects you will be supporting? And we'll start with Representative Sandell. Well, my first uh, priority for the bonding bill, of course, is the uh, Woodbury's request for uh, expansion and, and uh, improvement in the uh, um, City Park Center. And um, uh, it's a $15 million request to uh, support a $38 million uh, a project. I think that's uh, it's appropriate. Woodbury is growing quickly. It's a center for activity uh, uh, in the east, east uh, uh, eastern suburbs. And I think it's a uh, um, it's time for Woodbury to be able to uh, um, uh, have that support. The governor has announced a $700 million uh, uh, program for climate mitigation projects, and I haven't heard all the details of that, but that's certainly my second priority. The third one would be anything uh, which uh, uh, strengthens and improves the water infrastructure initiatives. Uh, the governor's asked $49 million for that, and uh, that's uh, something that I support as well. Housing is, uh, is the fourth thing that I think that uh, uh, deserves attention with bonding. Thank you. Um, now we'll go to Senator Begum. Thank you. Um, I believe uh, housing is a top priority for bonding. Um, every time Representative Jurgens and I were just at a meeting with the city of Cottage Grove and they talk about how when they try to get developers here and go to the CDA with the county, they don't have enough money. So that's that's got to be a top priority. Um, the uh, Representative Jurgens and I will be working on a bill with the Civic Center in Hastings. Um, 
Senator Duckworth and I are going to be working on a bill, and I'm assuming it'll be Tony's in the House, um, about improvements to the Dakota County Government Center in Hastings. And then um, we're also talking about, uh, with the City of Cottage Grove and Woodbury, about uh, some additions and improvements to the Hero Center, which has been so unbelievably uh, popular, uh, like maybe a, a burn house or something to, to help with training uh, on the uh, rescue side of things as well. So all those are up in the air, but we need to pass one. It's jobs, it's being a good partner with our local uh, government as well. Thank you. And then we'll move to Representative Jurgens. Thank you. This is a great opportunity this year to um, hit some of the big things in a bonding bill or an infrastructure bill that we normally do. Uh, but there's deferred maintenance throughout the state of Minnesota, the buildings and responsibilities that the state has. So it would be a great opportunity to get caught up on that. Uh, higher, higher education asset preservation. So that's HEPR funding at the uh, higher education, the, the University of Minnesota system and the Minsku system. Um, that's asset preservation. Um, this uh, flood hazard mitigation has a seven to one. Every dollar you spend in flood hazard mitigation has $7 in return. So it's a good year to invest in that uh, as well as public facilities authority, the PFA, that's your wastewater treatment plants throughout the state. Um, and then uh, locally, uh, as Carla mentioned, the ice arena in Hastings, as well as a charging station and trail uh, request that they have there. Great, thank you so much. And now we will listen to um, Senator Kent. Yep. Okay. Thanks, sorry, I was going, thought you were going to do another question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say, you know, uh, my colleagues have done a good job of outlining really the amazing opportunities uh, that we can achieve for our state this time around if we do a good, um, ambitious and uh, solid, uh, bonding proposal. Um, my particular priorities are, uh, like Senator, like Representative Sandell said, um, uh, I am the Senate author for the Central Park Project uh, in Woodbury, a tremendous regional asset. It's hard to believe it's only 20 years old, and if you look at it, it looks like it's in good shape, but it is, um, it is way uh, bursting at the seams in terms of the demand from our communities, um, and it does have some uh, structural and mechanical type issues that need support. So expansion and, and updating is it's a big one. Um, housing is been talked about. Um, that is a place where if we leverage housing bonds with private funds and local funds as well, it is a little bit of state investment, relatively speaking, that goes so far. And we know housing is just a huge issue in terms of people and their lives and having access to affordable quality housing. And also in our communities, both in the metro and in, in rural uh, Minnesota, it's so important. Thank you, Senator Kent. And I'll turn it back to Jody. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Vivian. Next question. Uh, Minnesota is forecasted to have a $7.7 .7 billion budget surplus for the fiscal 2022-23 biennium. In previous years, budget surpluses have ranged from $1 billion to $1.6 billion and were viewed largely as forecasts that could change. Do you believe the $7.7 .7 billion surplus is an accurate forecast? And if not, why isn't it accurate? And if so, what is the best way to spend these dollars? And we begin with uh, Senator Carl and uh, Senator Bigham. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by accurate. Um, we have professionals uh, in MMB and Department of Revenue that work, so I'm not quite understanding that comment. But um, uh, I think that we need to take a look at. Um, tax cuts for working middle class folks. Um, I'd like to take a look at the first and second tier tax um, levels. I'd like to expand the property tax credit. Um, I'd also like to look at heating assistance, expanding that program. Um, and I uh, agree with Representative Jurgens. Uh, and twice we've done it in the five sessions I've been there with lifting the, raising the, the roof, if you will, the ceiling on social security uh, so that fewer Minnesotans pay uh, social security uh, taxes in Minnesota. So I think those are some good ones, but I also think schools, obviously, uh, the environment. Um, and, and I think that we should also be replenishing the funds that we have borrowed from in the past. Uh, we have an opportunity to use that with one-time money. Um, there are, sorry, there is a chunk of it that is ongoing, but a lot of this is, is one-time. Thank you, Carla. 
Next, Representative Jurgens. Thank you. Well, as I sp stated earlier, and you all know, we set the, the two-year budget uh, in June of this past uh, year. And so the budget is set. We don't have to spend this money. And, and keep in mind, this is a forecast. It's not money in the bank yet. This is a projected forecast. Uh, I think, though, uh, in addition to the tax cuts that I mentioned earlier on Social Security, we should take a look at permanent tax cuts. Uh, we do not have to spend this money, especially since it's not actually in the door yet. Uh, we could realize that income and then take that into consideration for budgeting next year. Um, but as far as what we should be spending it on, uh, the majority of that should be on one-time spending, like I mentioned earlier, some of the infrastructure projects, um, paying down debt for uh, uh, bonding that we've done in the past, uh, and, and other one-time spending, since the majority of this, as Carla said, is one-time money uh, in the surplus. Thank you, Tony. Next, um, Senator Kent. So um, first of all, a comment about um, the accuracy of it, because one interpretation is we'll get another updated forecast in February. And so, um, you know, the, it was, we feel pretty confident that it was accurate as of late November, but uh, we'll get a new forecast and that's what we'll base all our decisions on this time. Um, I want to um, address something that Representative Jurgen said. In the terms of the formulas and the way that our budget is constructed, tax cuts are spending. Um, and so, you know, you can either spend, you know, $500 million in a tax cut, you can spend $5 million in education funding, it has the exact same net effect on our budget. Um, it, I uh, agree, we can definitely make sure that more seniors um, who are more, if you will, middle income seniors, uh, get relief in social security breaks there. I don't think we need to provide breaks to our really wealthiest seniors because they are funding important services for other seniors and our kids and our communities. Education, we need to use this opportunity because so many people have struggled during the pandemic and this is an opportunity to make a real difference for people who need it. And we need to be careful in how we do any tax cuts to make sure that they're done fairly. Thank you, Susan and Representative Sandow. Well, I saw the question uh, that uh, Vivian sent out. I contacted uh, the senior legislative fiscal uh, um, analyst in, in the House and uh, said, is this uh, um, budget forecast uh, real? And she uh, wrote back and said, um, it, it is. Um, we at anticipate a $7.7 .7 billion uh, surplus in uh, uh, fiscal 22-23. And slightly less to uh, $5.9 billion in the, in the following year. But as Tony said, these are in fact estimates and, and they can change, uh, particularly if uh, we do a lot of spending or if we uh, uh, talk about uh, tax cuts. So we have to be uh, cautious. My uh, interest, uh, as, uh, as others have said, is in one-time spending because uh, making a commitment uh, uh, based on these estimates for long-term is uh, continue go continually going to uh, uh, ask the taxpayers for their support. So um, the uh, uh, work we need done on infrastructure, the work we need at our uh, colleges and universities would be very helpful. Well, thank you, Steve. And I have a follow-up question to that is, is the surplus a reflection of overtaxing or a robust or part of a robust and thriving economy? And that open up to any one of you who would like to address that. Okay, Susan. Um, I was actually gonna address, um, a, a, a try to come back to part of this. First of all, um, the same essentially uh, laws that we had, had us looking at deficits not that long ago. And then now because the economy has turned around, the laws that we have are showing this surplus. So, you know, the reality is that some people have done really well during the pandemic. Um, we know not everyone has. The other thing that I think is important that people understand, and I know I've talked about this, is in our law for defining the budget balance, and whether you call it a surplus or whether you call it a deficit, there's no inflation factored in for almost all of our spending. We have to factor in inflation on receipts and sales tax, property tax, et cetera, but we don't include inflation for our schools, for example. So when we have a budget year, and this actually technically isn't a budget year, we don't have to pass these. Um, we are constantly debating how much of the inflationary increases are we going to keep up with? And if you look at, for example, Social Security goes up with inflation, <clears throat> thankfully, but our education budgets don't, and neither do a lot of our other budgets. And so that's a real challenge. It's not built into when we see a surplus, and people need to keep that in mind. We need to make that change, actually. Thank you, Susan. Any other comments? Okay. Carla? Oh. Okay. 
Yeah. I second. Yep. Sorry. I second and say amen to what Susan said. Um, and I would just add that it wasn't that long ago where we didn't tax items that were on purchase online. So um, wafer tax, um, I think, wait, anyway, uh, something like that, that company that a lot of people use. I don't. Um, and so uh, that is that has helped. But also, um, thanks to, uh, you know, President Biden and the Democrats in Congress, the simulation, the stimulant uh, package that went through kept money in the pockets of working Minnesotans. Um, and I think this pandemic showed the disparities that occurred amongst workers and what what exactly you do for a living um, was just laid for everyone to see um, on, on what's happened. And we did a good job of reacting to this pandemic and it held people um, afloat. And um, I, therefore it held our economy afloat. And so I think that's important to notice, note too about um, how the, uh, the economy is growing at over 6% and our unemployment is um, right above 3%, like 3.1. So just, those are good things. Thanks, Carolyn. Steve or Tony, any comment about that? Yeah, okay. well, Tony? even obviously this budget uh, forecast is is far greater than anything we've ever seen. Uh, but even in, in my time in the legislature, I'm in my third term, we've had a budget surplus every year, thankfully. Um, I've never had to be a part of, of uh, a budget deficit and, and the, the tough decisions that need to be made there. Um, but I think there, the, Yes, I think that that we should take a look at permanent tax cuts. I think when you see a surplus year after year, um, there there are taxes that I think should be uh, right sized or downsized. Um, but the biggest factor is the federal money that came into the economy, um, and that's the other side of that coin. Is when you have more money in the economy, you see inflation, and that's what we're seeing every day at the grocery store, at the gas station, everywhere you go. Um, our electric bills, everything is going up. Um, and that is uh, one of the contributing factors is because of all of the money that was pumped into the economy as a result of the COVID pandemic. Thanks, Tony. And Steve, any additional well, uh, Yesterday, the, the four of us heard a presentation from uh, the Stillwater School District, and um, uh, they um, talked about the same issues that uh, Susan was talking about a while ago. We made an, a, a, a largest uh, uh, increase in, in funding to, to K-12 education during this last session to, I think it's $560 million. Remarkably, $513 million was just simply to cover inflation. Uh, uh, Susan's comment about uh, inflation and, and, and factoring inflation in, into the uh, surplus is, is important. We may talk a little bit later today about uh, uh, covering unemployment uh, insurance uh, uh, deficits, and that's a, that would be an appropriate one-time uh, uh, expenditure as well. All right, thanks, Steve. Next question, um, it will be coming from Vivian. Thank you, Jody. Um, in 2020, the legislature passed a compromise policing bill that many Minnesotans do not believe go far enough in holding police accountable for misconduct. Freedom of Information Act research conducted by the Center Square revealed that across the state of Minnesota, taxpayers paid police settlements ranging from $50,000 to more than $24 million between 2018 and 2020. This demonstrates that police misconduct costs taxpayers millions of dollars each year but those responsible for misconduct are rarely held liable or accountable for their conduct. Can constituents expect the legislature to address the issues of police accountability and the financial liability caused by police misconduct this legislative session? If not, when can we expect the legislature to revisit the issue of police accountability? And we'll start with Senator Kent. Um, so, you know, I think it's been pretty clear that there has been in our divided government much more interest in looking at these issues from the DFL led house and uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, but much more reluct reluctance in the Republican led Senate. And that's why we've ended up with these compromise um, solutions. You know. I don't know about you guys if you saw that clip from Tennessee where that guy was 
have had a box cutter was obviously having some sort of issue and a whole bunch of policemen i think there were 37 rounds um shot at him i mean there are some issues and everybody agrees there are issues and we need to figure out the best ways to address those to make sure that um, police are held accountable when they don't um, treat people fairly for any number of reasons. Um, and certainly race has been an important part of this conversation and needs to continue to be. But um, I don't think we're going to see a lot this this session, um, but it is a conversation that needs to keep happening. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so now we'll hear from Representative Steve Sandell. Uh, I think the answer to your question uh, is uh, uh, I don't have any idea. I don't have any idea when our legislature can uh, approach this issue and and discuss it uh, in a way that that uh, respects the variety of, of um, opinions across the uh, uh, across the board from the very uh, um, most progressive, I suppose, uh, points of view to uh, more conservative issues. Susan's absolutely right. And Tony, and I'm sure Carla agrees with this, this is an enormously complex issue. Uh, talking about the issues of, of public safety and policing from one point of view um, may be criticized as blaming the victim. Uh, uh, speaking about it from another point of view uh, uh, would be criticized by saying, uh, uh, if you uh, want to uh, uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the ability of, of, uh, of law enforcement to take action, you're going to uh, sacrifice public safety. I'd uh, love to see the, the legislature uh, uh, in a bipartisan, uh, respectful manner approach this issue and see what we can do for the benefit of our constituents. I think we haven't done a, good, a very good job. Thank you. And um, Senator Bigham, please. Thank you. Um, I think first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that the last couple of years have been tough. They've been tough on um, Minnesotans, tough on our frontline medical workers and tough on police. Um, and we're gonna have to uh, deal with the societal changes we are having together and in a respectful manner and in a manner that has everyone at the table. Um, I have to say that we're down a lot of police officers across this state and that prohibits them from uh, investigating cases when you now have pencil pushing investigators <laughs> back on the beat uh, because they're short on beat cops. And so um, we, I think one of the best things we can do is um, look at the retention and recruitment of how we are hiring police officers um, so that we have safe communities, so that we have safe um, uh, jobs for people to go home at the end of the night because that's all they want to do too. And so um, I think those are the types of discussions you can expect this session. Thank you. Representative Jurgens, please. Uh, first of all, is it, when it comes to policing and public safety, I think you're asking the wrong question. Um, the legislature needs to focus on helping police rather than demeaning them. Uh, we need to restore city and our safe, uh, safety in our cities and make sure that the criminals are being held accountable by judges and prosecutors. You can't turn on the TV without hearing about violent crime. And it's not just in Minneapolis and St. Paul, it's spilling into Woodbury and other suburban cities, Cottage Grove. That's where we need to have our focus. We need to have our focus on uh, putting away the people that are continuously making, uh, causing the, the, the criminal activity. It's it, the repeat customers. It's the same people. Um, they get arrested, they commit a crime, they get arrested and they get let out and they do it again. And that's where what we, what we need to focus on is the recidivism. We need to have longer sentences and keep the, the worst of the worst in jail longer. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jody. Thank you, Vivian. Our next question has to do with redistricting. The principles and maps submitted by the parties in the Minnesota House, Senate, and the courts are significantly different in other states, in other states with a similar process as Minnesota. Both parties draw maps that are beneficial to their party's interests. Once maps are gerrymandered, it takes multiple decades to reverse the um, effects and the courts have drawn on drawn our maps for the past five decades due to Minnesota's divided government. There is no assurance that we will have a divided government in the future. Based on this, what is your perspective on changing the current redistricting process in Minnesota? 
and we'll begin with uh, Senator Kent. Um, well, so we're not going to take that up this year. I can just about guarantee it. Um, so from my perspective, and I have supported a, a different approach, which to really do it would require constitutional amendment in Minnesota. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, since I've announced that I, this will be my last session, I'm probably not going to have a chance to keep working on this issue as a, as a legislator. Um, but, you know, we do need to figure out how to have fair maps. This system, Jody, to your point of your question, um, has worked because uh, for a variety of reasons over the decades, um, our, our process here in Minnesota has turned it over to the, the court panel. Um, and we all are pretty sure that's going to be what happens again this time because it's unlikely in the first two weeks of this session that we are that we'll manage to get a, a, a consensus map. Um, but yeah, that's something we absolutely need to keep working on because um, we need a better system than we've got in Minnesota, even though ours, ours isn't nearly as bad as many other states. All right, then next to um, Representative Sandel. When I first joined the legislature, I uh, argued uh, 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 with passion that the legislature should assume its, its constitutional responsibility and that uh, we should be able to draw these maps uh, uh, respectfully uh, and uh, with uh, 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 insight and analysis uh, to support us. But uh, after a couple of years in the legislature, I have changed my mind. I agree with Susan that we'd need a statute or constitutional change to establish a commission to uh, handle this uh, issue. I, I'm sad to say that because I do think that uh, uh, there are people in the legislature who could get together and, 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 and address this issue. But across the nation, it has just not happened. And um, I, I believe that there is an exceptional element to Minnesotans, but. Uh, on this, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, uh, my position uh, will be a, uh, a constitutional member of statute establishing a, a, a nonpartisan uh, commission to uh, handle redistricting. Thank you. Senator Bigham. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not dealing with this. So um, I, would, I would say that, you know, courts will put out a map on the probably 15, 16, maybe they'll wait till that Monday uh, and, that's just how it's going to be. Uh, I think it should be an impartial um, panel. Uh, I support the league's position on it, um, but as long as we have the political makeup we have now, it ain't happening. So, and I'm sorry about my lighting. I feel like I'm on Bohemian Rhapsody or something like going on. I don't know what's going on. It must be the morning light or something. Thank you. And then a uh, representative Jorgens. Well, I, I think that the the process that we have should work. Uh, and I'm saying that as a Republican, knowing that we were only a couple of seats away from having the Democrats control the Senate, uh, as well as the House and the governor's office. Um, had that taken place, I'm sure that the maps being drawn uh, would be very favorable to the Democrats like they did in New York, Nevada, New Mexico, and Oregon, I think was the other one. Um, but again, we're not gonna take this up this year. It'll be another 10 years before the, the issue comes up. Um, I. As far as a impartial uh, panel, uh, I don't think there's any such thing. Uh, there's no way around partiality. People that would seek to be on that panel would have a bias one way or another. And so it's only as impartial as um, you know the means of which they, are, they get appointed. I think that there needs to be accountability and legislators have that accountability. Thank you. And we toss it back to Vivian for the next question. Thank you, Jody. Um, the budget forecast surplus did not include money from the American Rescue Plan Act that provided 1.9 trillion in stimulus funds for states to use to help fuel the economic recovery and provide aid to public health programs. Minnesota received $8.5 billion. Do you believe Minnesota spent these funds wisely and where might the state direct unspent funding? And the first question goes to Senator Sandell. Oh, uh, Representative Sandell, I gave you, oh boy. No, 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 not Senator, Representative. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I just gave me two more years of my term in office. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I thought about this question uh, uh, since receiving the, uh, my note from you, uh, uh, Vivian, and uh, I think the answer to that is going to be a, a long while before we're able to be confident of, of whether we've, spent, we've done a good job with this. Uh, we made a decision uh, to uh, use the money in three different ways. One was in uh, immediate uh, uh, response to, to COVID. And I think that that was done well. We, we spent $500 million immediately, I think in March of 2020. Um, uh, we we uh, uh, helped cover uh, uh, unemployment. We, uh, we uh, uh, helped with uh, uh, summer school. We uh, 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 try to give help to uh, businesses as well. The governor has a great deal of authority on the use of this money uh, and his uh, decisions uh, as far as long-term um, uh, changes will, uh, will be uh, uh, developing over, over this next year. One of the other issues that, that, we, that we're dealing with with that money is uh, equity issues. And uh, that's uh, another issue, I guess. Thank you. Um, okay, now, Senator Bigum, please. Thank you. Um, so maybe I didn't hear the question, but but we got about $8 billion. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on the infrastructure bill. Oh, and okay. That, that we haven't received any guidance on, um, but I could tell you that the ones on this call are going to have some ideas to spend that <laughs> money. Um, and so um, there's pots of money for roads and bridges, there's pots of money for clean water, there's pots of money for broadband, there's pots of money for transit and bus rapid transit that both uh, everybody on this call represents uh, a line, a future line or a planned line. So, um, of course, heck yeah, we're going to um, be requesting money for those. Um, and then the other um, money that you're talking about that was done uh, for small businesses. Uh, and for families uh, and a lot of other areas. Yes, that was that was spent correctly and it helped the economy is showing that. And I will say this, that um, we have to do some tax conformity yet. We still have some tax conformity issues, especially for the money for restaurants uh, that came down uh, the second half. We have some conformity issues that I expect to be addressed early on in this session. Thank you. And so now we will move to representative Jurgen. Thank you. And there's, it's impossible, unfortunately, to have that amount of money coming in from the federal governor, government and think that, um, that there aren't going to be problems with that. We need to make sure that um, how that money was spent, because it was coming in quickly and people were reacting quickly. We need a full audit on, on retroactively on where that money spent and how it was spent, um, because you know that they're, unfortunately, there will be uh, fraudulent spending that is found. As far as what we need to, or what we should be doing with the remaining of that, and, and Carla touched on this, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. Um, because of so many people that were on unemployment, uh, that uh, was depleted, the federal government bailed us out, and then now we have to pay the federal government back. So all employers are paying uh, higher taxes now into that fund when we could get away from that by just using the federal money to replenish that trust fund and pay back the federal government. Thank you. Um, we'll move to Senator Kemp, please. Um, this is a tough one to talk about in one minute, but I'll do my best too. Um, mm -hmm. So if we're talking about the um, federal money that came through in the spring of 2021, um, we went into overtime of session to specifically to incorporate that into our state budget, which are separate, totally separate spending packages. But we knew with those federal funds in there, we needed them to work together. Um, because it's a biennial budget, this first year of the budget, we did some allocations there and the governor and the legislature dictated how those would be spent. A lot of COVID direct spending, healthcare, childcare, um, that kind of thing, education, support for our schools, that kind of thing. We set aside another about a billion dollars, I think, that we will come back and look at um, to, to reallocate. That was part of this, this two-year plan. Um, and so uh, we do have more to do. One thing we've really learned is we're not done, or COVID's not done with us yet. I know some people are done with COVID, but COVID's not done with us. And so we need to be prepared to respond and make sure we can get quality masks out to make sure that our testing can can meet the needs when when a new variant comes up and we and we do get some sort of surprise uh so you know we need to be thoughtful in how we do this i'll say one more thing real quickly i know i'm over time um you know steve talked about we 
in our state budget, we met inflationary increase. Well, we now know inflation is higher than we planned on when we set that budget. So we might want to, you know, make up some difference there too. So a lot of, a lot of things we can take care of. Thank you very much. Um, I will turn it back to Jody. Thanks, Vivian. We now go to our audience question, um, collaboration versus gridlock. So America's two-party political system is dependent upon and is most effective when the parties work together. Your constituents' patience is wearing thin with regard to the current gridlock of the two-party political system and the ineffectiveness of the Minnesota split legislature. Tell us what you would do in the upcoming session to ensure civil conversation, transparency, and effective collaboration. Please give specific examples. And that would go to Senator Bigham. First, can I also say to re tap into what the last question was, oh. um, child care, daycare costs are a huge um, issue and the remaining money has, some of it has gone towards that. And I think we have to continue to focus on that because that obviously feeds the workforce and a lot of those um, folks uh, are obviously mothers that need to get, go to work and they can't have daycare options or can't afford it. So that's a problem. And that's another thing that the one time money needs to be for. Um, you know, I have to say I'm the only senator that has two Republican House members. And, yeah, you know, we may not agree, um, but man, uh, we make the best effort to be transparent to communicate well with each other in a respectful way. I mean, we've known each other, known each other for over 20 years, so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, Tony is not a townie, though. I mean, so Keith and I have rank on that. But um, we get along well because we communicate and we set boundaries and expectations for each other about how we're going to work together. Man, if the rest of the legislature would look at Keith, Tony, and I, we'd get a lot of stuff done. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And back, and then now to Representative Jurgens. There's a lot more bipartisanship than what people see. And I've said this um, on these forums in the past as well. But when, you know, we'll, we'll stand up on the House floor and we'll argue back and forth and make our political points. And, and then we'll walk across the street back to the office and I'll ask Steve how he's doing. I mean, you know, we have a good relationship with members on, on both sides of the aisle. Some of my best friends, uh, in the legislature um, are House members on the other side of the aisle. So uh, unfortunately, where you see the biggest partisanship is at the leadership levels um, when, it, for example, in the House, our leader was not even part of the discussions uh, when it kind of came to the budgets last year. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. I think at that level, where that's where we need to see um, more compromise and people working together than what we've seen in, in recent years. And that happened both when Republicans were in charge and when Democrats are. Thank you. Next is um, Senator Kent. For example, Tony and I have carried a bill together and worked really closely together. Um, and so it is very possible. And he is right that it does happen more than people know. But one of the things I've sort of studied, and let's be clear, um, I was the caucus leader at the same time that uh, Tony's caucus leader was not included in those discussions and neither was I. That wasn't partisanship specifically per se. But part of the problem, it, it is that we as leaders need to lead. And too often, um, people are reluctant to make reasonable compromises because they are, know they are going to get really slammed by extreme members of the wing of their party. And so that's why things get delayed really long. Nobody wants to compromise until the last possible minute and because otherwise they're going to hear about it and it's, you know, it's going to be a, a problem. Our whole system is really challenged right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of in a moment of reflecting on this and I'm going to keep thinking about it and talking about it. Um, but it would really help if elected leaders would stand up for the right thing, um, even if they know that it will not make them popular with some of their loudest voices in their, in their party. Thank you. And Representative Sandel. This has been uh, my uh, um, 
greatest frustration in the two years that I've served in the in the or the three years that I've served in the legislature. Um, I believe the the five of us on this call could sit down and and work on a, a bill or work on a compromise or or be part of a conference committee or could go together with the governor and come out with a a, a reasoned and a respectful decision. But uh, as Susan says, the pressures on our leadership, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, and I can talk about the House rather than the Senate, um, are, uh, are extreme. And uh, I think those uh, leaders are uh, work to try to keep the caucus together. But I, uh, I, I don't think that results in uh, everyone's voice being heard. Um, uh, how can we uh, resolve that? Boy, I don't know. Um, I have much more to say about that, but I don't want my frustration to get in the in the way of um, <laughs> of, of a uh, of an answer that's being recorded. I guess I I I'd, I'd love to be dedicated to the discussion and and, uh, and analysis and uh, and uh, fraternity uh, or sorority of uh, of this uh, uh, of this venture, but um, it's been very difficult. Thank you, Steve. And now I toss it back to Vivian for our next audience question. Vivian? Um, Jody, um, Tu Zhang is on, so maybe we can have him answer that question as well. Oh, one that yeah, you just I, I phrased. I was not aware of it. Yeah. Hello. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I was out door knocking for caucus, and so I didn't get your email. Well, so Good. glad that you can join us. Did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Okay, great. Yes, um, you know, we we were given this answer when I first before Steve and I got in. We got all we had all these great ideas on how we were going to change uh, the legislature, but um, you know, part of it goes to what Tony said. Uh, you know, a lot of the media focus is on how much we hate each other, how much we don't get along. Uh, but you know, Tony and I, we were at the state fair together, uh, handing out pamphlets. He got to meet my brothers. I got to meet his family. And so uh, one thing we try to do, or at least I try to do, is try to just get to know um, not just the other members, but their districts, their families, you know, how they view things. Because, uh, you know, like some House members out in rural Minnesota, you know, when their constituents are facing totally different types of things from us. Um, and so when I'm talking about, um, you know, building a bridge or traffic, you know, they're from rural Minnesota. They don't get the type of traffic that we do. And so um, trying to learn what, what um, you know, their communities are like too. And I invite them over. I have my mom cook for them and, you know, learn about my family, our culture. Uh, one of the, one member uh, is representing Nash, who he's like one of my best friends now. And we come from totally different backgrounds, totally different views on politics, different way of talking about our communities. And so uh, he's someone that, you know, I never knew that he spent time in Russia, that he was in Germany. Um, and he, you know, something that we just try to build a little bit uh, of things and uh, makes the house much more uh, colleg collegial. So uh, I, I guess little things goes a long way, but it's uh, so what we signed up for. <laughs> and, and could I add something to Vivian? Yes, please. Uh, I appreciate uh, Senator Kent's comments that regarding when she was minority leader and also not involved with, with the negotiations. And I knew that, but I didn't want to speak for you, Susan. Um, and, and maybe that's not a partisan issue. Maybe that's just the, one of the flaws in the way the legislature is being run right now. Um, where it's not, uh, you know, you have the, the leaders that are making the decisions uh, for the rest of us. And in too many cases, it's just the majority leaders and the minority leaders aren't even in on the discussion. And then the rest of us, um, we get a bill, a budget bill of, with billions and billions of dollars, almost $50 billion worth of budget. And it's take it or leave it. We don't really have any input in, in that budget. And that's just flat wrong. And that happens regardless of who's in charge. Uh, so I'm not blaming one party or the other. It needs to change. All right, yeah. thank you. And now I will toss it back to okay. the next I, question. I would, 
I would just like to just insert something here. In, and I've had an opportunity to watch some of the sessions. And there is a lot of vitriol in those sessions against one group or another. And so while this group may be working together, I think we all need to admit that there is some conflict and um, things aren't working as well as they should. So any other comments on that? Uh, uh, just to toss that out. I can't see everybody, so. Uh, as I said, I just wanna go back uh, kind of to what I was saying. You know, um, unfortunately in this climate with the media, and I think um, the point is exactly right that um, the media sees a cat fight and that's all they wanna focus on. They don't wanna talk about the stuff that we actually managed to do together. Um, they don't wanna talk about the details of what we're doing. Um, but uh, also social media, you know, I know which of my tweets are going to get more likes and retweets than the other ones, you know, it's not the kumbaya ones, you know, and my point is two, twofold. One is, as a, as a population, we have to reward um, compromise, we have to reward people doing the work of, of working together and trying to come to solutions, because we, that's what legislation is. Um, and so I say that to all of us. And I'll note that my colleague Joanne Ward is um, in the audience and she's doing a lot of great work in that issue as well and trying to make sure that people can communicate well together. But as elected people, and I'll be partisan here on this one, you know, for example, when we have in the Minnesota Senate Republicans who will not acknowledge that the election was in 2020 was free and fair, and that the, um, uh, the, the insurrection on January 6th was not good, it was a problem and we should stand up against that. That's a problem, you know, that is because they know they'll catch heat for it. I have a lot of colleagues in the Minnesota Senate who believe in vaccines. They are very much vaccinated. They believe in masks, um, but they won't stand up to the extreme views in their party. And I know there are similar dynamics that happen on the DFL side as well. So it's a twofold thing. We need elected people to stand up for what they know is right, for science, for facts, for truth. And we also need um, people in the public to reward those who do. So that's my soapbox on that one, Vivian. Thank you for continuing this conversation. So Vivian, I will say that I mean, Susan, Susan stole everything, especially at the end that I was gonna say, but I mean, um, I, have, I have spoken out on um, some of the issues that have faced the House, that have faced the Senate, and have caught a lot of heat for it um, that were issues in my own party. Um, I don't regret that at all because it's standing up for what's right. Now I can't force other people that I serve with or on the other side of the aisle or in the other body to do what is right, but Susan is correct. We have to reward that. And I think you see people like Representative Dean Phillips um, who speaks out um, in the wrong on things. Liz Cheney, how many, how many people here ever thought Democrats would like somebody with the last name of Cheney? And she's like a breath of fresh air understanding that we're in this together on this very fragile uh democracy we have right now that has to be rewarded and instead and look at what happened in arizona i mean they censured um a, a democrat cinema for for a vote um you can't do that i mean that is that is the stuff that will plan play out in an election it should not play out when we're doing policy and on the floor and having to do our jobs that people have have sent us there for Oh, you look like you had a comment. Yeah, I just want to add what you know, Vivian. When you when you watch the legislature, legislator on legislature on TV, um, you can see the what the back and forth, what you call a vitriol. What you don't see though is after that, where the two members that were just going at it back and forth, one will walk over to the other and pat you know they'll pat him on the back and they'll and they'll smile about boy that was a good point you made. You know it's a it's a debate. And so it's not always as personal as it looks like. Sometimes it is, but uh, most of the time, um, it's just it's part of the process. And and it's and the, those same people um, will ha have a great deal of respect for each other, but they're um, but they just disagree on the issues, and that's what they're what they're trying to point out. Now, I will also say um, that there are times when and and Steve and Tua maybe can shed some light on it if they choose to, um, but. 
there are some partisan issues like last year when we weren't able to pass the PPP and unemployment insurance income tax break. The Senate did it bipartisanly. Uh, I know that's not a word, but but they did it in a bipartisan manner. Um, the House wouldn't even take it up. And it's because of House lead, the Democrats in leadership wanted to use that as a bargaining chip later in session. And who got hurt from that? The businesses and the individuals that had to file their income tax. And I don't blame Steve and, and Tua for that because it's above their pay grade. I do blame their leadership because it was their decision to just punt that down, the, down to the end of session and use it for political points. And I'm afraid they're gonna do the same thing with the unemployment trust fund this year. Instead of doing the right thing right away, like we should, it's gonna get held to the end of session. Okay, I want to chime. Can I chime in on this one just really quickly? Please. I promise, because this is Tony. You're exactly right, but the reality is there. Even though there was bipartisan support in both bodies to to do some relief um, on the PPP side, for sure, we had to figure out how and how much in the context of the bigger budget conversation. Um, there was also a question about what we were going to do to support workers, and in the Senate. Um, there was no support for that part of it. So that's why we end up with these things getting linked, because if we need, no, you know, if we believe we need to do two things and there's bipartisan support for one part of it, often that will benefit businesses, but perhaps not working families, um, then the only way to make sure that we do the one is to link them together and, 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 and that way we can do both things. And so it's, it's a little more nuanced than that. You're not wrong about that part, but the context there is important. Or, or Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think the this brief discussion uh, uh, represents what's uh, happened to um, um, uh, our Republican form of representative government. Uh, we become uh, so divided on, on issues and, and uh, uh, we find it so difficult to uh, um, be public in, in our uh, uh, differences, but respectful in our differences at the same time. Um, our caucus had a, uh, uh, a press conference uh, last week on the issue of public safety. Um, if we're really interested in public safety, if we're really interested in, in the, the welfare of the society, uh, our, our caucus should have been represented and so should have the Republicans. Uh, we were talking about the police, but there were no uh, law enforcement representatives at that, at that press conference. Uh, we can start out the session by saying there are some general ideas that, that, and concepts that we uh, agree on. We're going to work hard to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, benefit our uh, constituents on all of these issues. Um, we'll argue over the way to do it, but uh, we want to be, uh, uh, we want to, uh, and during that press conference, we called the Republicans names. We called them demagogues. We called them silly. We called them short-sighted. That's not going to attract any votes. What it's going to do is con convince our, our constituents that we're better at bickering than we are at governing. Uh, my concern is, is a uh, respectful governing and uh, it's, uh, it, it's been difficult to do. And, um, um, uh, it's a, as I say, it, I, I'm letting my frustration, I guess, get in my, uh, get in the way of policy discussions. Thank you. And two, anything? Oh, Otherwise, I, I would, yeah. oh, uh, I'll make this quick. Um, you know, certainly there are, uh, things that happen, you know, the partisanship that happens, the vitriol, as Vivian mentioned, it does happen. Um, but I, I guess what we're dedicated towards is to change that and to not add, add on to that. Um, of course, there are lots of uh, hard conversations we have to have there. Uh, conversations about race, where even folks in our own country can't even have, you know, uh, some can't even have an adult conversation on about it. So um, Steve, I, you know, all the other legislators, uh, on here, you know, we're dedicated towards uh, more respectable uh, political conversation uh, going forward, and we will bring try to bring that to the to the state house. And so, uh, that that's all I'll say, and we can uh, move on. Thank you. Can I, Jody? Can I just add one thing? People need to remember <laughs> that when you're on social media and there's comments, or when you're at a press conference. And, and there's a comment made personally about somebody, as Tu is saying, whether it's race or whether it's um, ideology or whatever. There's a human attached to that comment on the other side. And there's family, um, there's children that see that, um, and they see how people 
uh, act on it. Now, I'm the first to admit, everybody on this call knows I can get fired up and I do, but it's, it's over an issue. It's not over Tony's ideology or Susan's direction in the caucus or Steve, you know, whatever into whatever, you know, it is nothing personal. It is the policy and the fight that I bring for my residents every day. Um, but we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard, look in the mirror and it's going to start with us and people will follow. Um, thank you. And now I will toss it back to Vivian for another audience question. Thank Vivian? you very much. Um, prove it first legislation was introduced last year to protect Minnesota's water quality. It intends to prevent pollution from the mining of copper, nickel, sulfide rock. This type of mining doesn't exist in Minnesota yet, but mines are pending. The PolyMet mine can impact Lake Superior, Twin Metals, the Boundary Water Canoe Area, Talon, the Mississippi and or St. Croix rivers, and more mines are pending. Elsewhere, copper nickel sulfide mines pollute the water with sulfuric acid, mercury, and other toxics. Prove It First requires that before receiving a Minnesota mining permit, the company must produce independent scientific proof that a copper nickel sulfide mine has operated commercially in a similar environment for at least 10 years or has been closed for at least 10 years without causing pollution. What is your position on this legislation? And I'd like to start with Representative Jurgens, please. Uh, well, first of all, I'd have to learn more about the Prove It First legislation. I'm not that familiar with it before I decide voting for it or against it. Um, I, I do believe that that mining can be done and is done uh, responsibly. Uh, and honestly, I have no idea if the House leadership plans to bring this forward in this session or not. Thank you. Um, Representative Zhang? Yes. Um, yeah, so this was actually uh, brought up to my office a, a few years ago uh, by the Boundary Waters folks uh, trying to protect, you know, the Great Lakes that we have here in northern Minnesota, and I'm in support of it. Uh, I know that it was law in Wisconsin from, I think it was from 1998 till, until it was repealed in 2017, and so we know it works elsewhere. Um, and, you know, the copper sulfide mine, you know, it, we want to, we want to have a standard in, in which we can measure and we can protect our boundary waters. And so that's something, uh, personal to me too. And that I, it's something that I think it's vital for our state of Minnesota. If it's gone, there's no, there's no technology to bring back our boundary waters, you know? And so for, for me, I, I'm in support of it prove it first legislation. Thank you, too. Um, let's move on to Senator Kent. Um, I have been looking at this and I am leaning towards supporting this legislation. It has not gotten a hearing in the in the Senate, but um, I, uh, along with most of my caucus in the Senate, uh, support it. Um, it is, you know, traditional mining, um, uh, iron ore, taconite, that has worked fine in Minnesota. We have good processes and good protections, and that's that's one thing. Copper sulfide, copper sulfide mining is a completely different beast, and we don't know, and that's the point. Um, I remember former state auditor Rebecca Otto talked about this from the fiscal liability standpoint. Um, the potential costs to clean up a massive spill and, and contamination from these types of mining activities is just significant. And do we have the assurances we need that the companies responsible would be there to do it? I don't know, because do we want the Minnesota taxpayers? And to two's point, you know, once once that water source is damaged 
that's going to go on for generations. Um, it may never be able to be brought back. So I do think it is, you know, if somebody says they want to come do something to your house and it'll be perfectly fine when they spray whatever all over the outside of your house, you're going to say, I want to see some evidence. I want to see some proof before you do this to my house. Um, that's just common sense. And so I think, I think there's real reason here to, to pay attention on these two particular, in this particular type of mining. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sandell. I've supported the legislation and uh, the concept of uh, prove it first. Uh, the owners of uh, twin metals and polymet have left nothing but uh, 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 environmental pollution and uh, destruction in other parts of the world where they've uh, mined. I do believe that the mining industry is enormously important to Minnesota, it has been historically, uh, and that uh, I, I hope that uh, um, the technology of safe mining can be pursued and uh, accomplished. Uh, uh, I know that the criticism of saying not uh, here in the, the United States brings up the, uh, uh, the, su the suggestion of economic imperialism in other parts of the, the world where uh, um, uh, defense against labor practices is, is a low. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, only one chance with water we have only one chance with our uh, natural uh, environment. And at the moment, I support the legislation wholeheartedly. Thank you. Repres um, Senator Bigham. Thanks. Um, like a comment? You know, the, the, I, I really agree with where um, Susan is at on this because every one of us on this call also had to deal with the PFAS issue in our groundwater. And we got nearly a billion dollar settlement that is not going to be enough. None of us will be here in 30 years um, in elected office, I wouldn't think. But um, that they're gonna have to deal with the residential water fees once that money runs out um, to change out uh, the money that is currently being used to clean up the PFAS issue from 3M. I have questions. I have questions about the legislation. I have questions about the mining. So I'm just not comfortable supporting something until I get questions resolved. And one of them, Steve alluded to it, is these are foreign corporations. How are we going to hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. The assurity money and the assurity fund that is in there is not sufficient at this moment. Um, and I just don't see, um, we have a process in place and that process needs to be followed. Same with line three, there is a process in place. You don't want 201 of us making that decision. I perfectly am fine with the PUC having like six different votes on it uh, and, and having hours of hearing and briefs on it. You don't want 201 of us of only which one is an engineer and his name's Jim Carlson. So, I mean, you don't, you don't want us making these decisions. So we do have to look at the process. And um, I think that's fair and that should be expected um, of the voters as well. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a quick shout out to our colleague, mm -hmm. Senator Ann Johnson Stewart, who is also a wonderful engineer. <laughs> My bad, I forgot. I forgot about Ann Johnson Stewart. All right, I will turn it over to Jody again. Thanks, Vivian. Another audience question. This has to do with, um, with electric vehicles becoming more prevalent. What is your vision of Minnesota's role in ensuring there is adequate infrastructure to support future growth of alternative fuels and vehicles? And that we start with our representative, Sean. So uh, our house speaker, she bought an electric vehicle and it has started a trend in the house. I haven't gotten mine yet, <laughs> but soon. Um, I think one, one thing is, uh, you know, investing or encouraging investment in fueling stations all across our state. I think that goes a long way. Um, I think the hesitancy from some folks is, you know, where am I going to get my refueling done? or How, how is the logistics of it going to work? Um, so, so for me, I, I think one, one, one beginning step we can do is, uh, investing in the fueling, refueling station and make it more available so folks would be more comfortable in driving uh, electric vehicles, which, you know, we, we know that it's, uh, it's much better for the environment and good Thank for you. the Minnesota economy, too. Thank you so much. Senator um, Kent? 
Um, I think this is one of those issues, and we see this in our society where, um, you know, as times change and circumstances change and people learn more, you just see a, just a change in people's outlook on something. And I think this is so exciting. Um, and you have to look no further than the private sector auto manufacturers and their absolute commitment to changing over their manufacturing of their fleet to be fully electric. Look at the success of the Ford F-150 truck, which is as, you know, just as traditional and heavyweight as it can be. Um, I think it's exciting that um, the infrastructure plan that was passed in Congress does support a lot of electrification. Um, I wish we could get the, um, the next bit of round, round of legislation passed that would go even further uh, because this is one of those things that once we get, once we get there, this will, this will work really well. Um, and it's you know, a little bit of investment from federal, state, and local, and we can pretty easily get where we need to be so that people can confidently um, drive electric vehicles um, as they need to. Thank you. Representative Sandel. I, uh, uh, I support the, uh, the uh, state's uh, dedication to 50% uh, uh, sales of, electri uh, of electric vehicles by, um, uh, I think it's 2030. I hope that the uh, technology uh, uh, advances as quickly as it has in the last 10 years. And I hope that uh, uh, public perception of electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicles is uh, uh, going to be positive as well. Um, there are issues to deal with. Uh, the issues of technology are, are certainly uh, um, uh, significant, but um, uh, we just don't, uh, we don't have time to, uh, to wait and um, we don't have time to, um, Continue, continue to um, jeopardize our environment with uh, the sort of pollution that uh, internal combustion engines uh, continue to offer. Thank you, Steve. Senator Bigham? Um, yeah, I think that using the infrastructure money for clean energy is absolutely necessary and imperative um, for charging stations and for um, making sure that we're um, going after our standards that we've set in place for clean air. Um, I, I, I tell you what, the, the um, clean cars legislation, um, it was, I, I just can't tell you how disappointed I was in the demeanor and behavior of my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle on this topic. I mean, it was over the top. And um, you say California, and it's like a trigger word for them now. Um, it just was ridiculous. Um, look, we got to have a clean, sustainable environment and, and um, we've got to have a balance. We've got to move in this direction. The consumers are there. We're moving there. We got to make sure Minnesota has the fair share uh, of the market. Uh, and we're going to continue to use those infrastructure dollars like in Hastings when we get the electric charging vehicle station down there and stuff like that. Fleets are going to it. Um, community cities are adopting them on their own. Look at Rochester. Look at Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth. Um, they're, they're all going through um, changes for sustainability. Um, our weather, our severe weather has impacted our economy our, um, and we have to respond to that um, and make sure we're rebuilding in ways um, that are gonna be sustainable for generations. So definitely um, support uh, legislation that will move uh, forward on this. Thank you, Carla and Representative Jurgens. Well, I don't have an electric vehicle, although Representative Garofalo let me drive his Tesla once. Uh, so I, I did have a little bit of experience with it. Look, the, the market is going in that direction for a lot of people. And I think that that's how it should be driven. I think car dealers are going to sell the vehicles that people want to buy. And more and more of those vehicles that they want to buy are going to be electric. You're just seeing that happen. I don't think that the, the government needs to put their thumb on the scale to push in that direction. I think the government has a place to help get some of the infrastructure in place for the charging stations. But on the other hand, the government's not building convenience stores and gas stations. So at some point, the, the private market should be able to take care of that as well. Um, there are charging stations in the parking ramp of the state office building. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that that's free. Well, my gas isn't free. So why aren't the people that are using that electricity paying for it? Thank you so much, Tony. And I did, lucky I got to ride in my nephew's Tesla, so I had that opportunity. Um, I think we have time for one more audience question, so I will toss that back to Vivian. Okay, um, 
Minnesota continues to see racial disparities in healthcare, housing, and education, in addition to other areas. What do you see as being the most important policy change that can reduce racial disparities in Minnesota? And I have to tell you, Minnesota made a top, they were on the top five list for um, the state with the least amount of support for um, African Americans and Blacks. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with uh, Representative Sandell. It's an important question for me. I, um, um, uh, I, I may be unpopular but, uh, with my response, but I believe that the disparities of Vivian that you're talking about are symptoms rather than causes. Sometimes symptoms have to be treated as to, uh, a, a, a painful cough has to be treated, uh, but the uh, cold and the causes of the disease is what we uh, need to deal with. Well, uh, my concern and my uh, dedication would be tax policy. If we can find a way to uh, uh, encourage uh, uh, a tax policy that is uh, that continues to be aggressively progressive as far as uh, our personal income is concerned, a tax policy that can su that can support uh, businesses uh, with uh, providing a, a uh, an environment where businesses can uh, prosper because they have a healthy uh, uh, and well-educated uh, um, uh, workforce. But uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to. Uh, uh, find a way to establish a wealth tax, which is probably a, a, a national issue rather than a state issue, and a capital gains tax, which we certainly could do here in Minnesota. Um, two of my favorite economists, uh, uh, Edward Stiglitz and, and Thomas Pinckney, talk about uh, the problems that we face with uh, uh, wealth disparities. And they both agree, and I certainly agree with them, that tax policy is going to be the hardest to change, but the most fundamental and necessary to change. Thank you. Um... Let's move on to Senator Begum. Thank you. Um, this is a passion of mine that I've worked with Senator Wicklin on, along with Representative Ruth Richardson and many other um, women of color in the House. Um, the uh, morbidity of African American women um, related to childbirth. Is, ex and is extremely high compared to white women. And that is due to the culturally appropriate and accessibility of healthcare options. And I think we passed this year um, a lot of good policy that uh, led by Representative Ruth Richardson um, and uh, related to improving that access, that cost of care, um, the importance, the advocacy, the outreach um, and hopefully that this will address um, the the disparities because uh, it needs to it needs to be addressed um, nationally. I know that there's been some action too. I'm not as familiar with that, um, but it is important, and that's where I have focused. Um, although I do know that we've done issues uh, uh, addressed issues on education, still not enough. Um, and uh, environmental justice, still not enough. Transportation, still not enough. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Um, Representative Jurgens. Well, there's a, a lot that you could answer on that question, but in one minute, I'll focus more on education. Uh, Minnesota has um, the worst, one of the worst, if not the worst achievement gaps in the entire nation. And I think one thing that we should be doing more of um, is having the, the public school funding follow the students so that they have a choice of going to a public school or a private school or a charter school, whatever best meets their needs. Um, I think that if they have access to the, the education um, that they maybe don't, don't have access to today for cost or whatever reason, um, that, that I think that that's the best thing that we can do to help educate our, our students of color um, so that they will be set for life with that, with the education that works best for them. Thank you. Um, Representative Young. Young? Yeah, um, given that we're doing, a, been door knocking for caucus, you know, I think voting uh, and voting rights is something that's a really, really big issue. I mean, we're dealing with communities that have historically been 
excluded from the voting process, the political process. I mean, it's winter, there's COVID, there's language and cultural issues and barriers. And so you can imagine, you know, why we're out here door knocking in the middle of winter. Cause no, 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 like our communities, they don't even know like, oh, so there's a caucus. So is it gonna be online? Is it not gonna be online? Nobody sent me a piece of mail. Like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go to vote. And so, I mean, they're just out of the political process. And so when we got legislators talking and they're, they're asking like, you know, how come I never heard of this before? Well, because they're not even part of the process, you know? And so I think voting and voting rights and the right to vote, uh, that's something that's really, really important. There's a whole host of legislation all throughout this country and some that are, will be introduced here in Minnesota to restrict voting rights. And so uh, I think for me, that's something that's really big for the communities of color. Uh, you know, the participation in the political process, uh, that's something that's really, really important. Thank, thank you. Um, Senator Kept. Um, this is an issue that I think about and work on a lot. Um, as most everyone knows, I was born and raised in the South. Um, I lived 20 years in Texas and I came from much more diverse communities. Uh, and then I had the privilege of moving to Minnesota with my Minnesota native husband and our young son on purpose because we know what a great state this is, what the quality of life is. And when I got here, I realized at a, at a real human level, not just the math of these disparities, but the practical nature of the disparities in this state. Um, we can talk a, long, a lot about, you know, the history of that and why. Um, the questions asks, you know, what one thing, and as you're hearing from my um, dedicated colleagues, there's not just one answer to this. This is pervasive. The House, um, led by the Posse Caucus um, last year held a working group, I believe it was led by uh, Representative Ruth Richardson and um, Rena Moran, I believe, um, and came up with a, a very important report. And I remember in some conversations about the, leg the, the legislative session and our issues, Speaker Melissa Hortman said, we're not gonna have an equity committee so that there's one area where we're looking at it. It needs to be across the board in everything we do. So as you've heard, it's in healthcare, it's in voting, which is so key. It's in um, uh, education. Yeah, we need more diverse teachers. Now that we've lost so many teachers, isn't this a great moment to think about how do we get serious about recruiting and retaining teachers of color to, so that they can reflect. And that's good for white students too, not just for students of color. Um, uh, Housing, if you wanna talk about one issue, housing to me is one of those core issues because um, diversity and connection within communities is a big part of it. And that's the Southern girls take on this is that um, far too many um, white Minnesotans only live near other white Minnesotans. And that has been the case for a long time. I am so proud of our communities here in the East Metro that are becoming so much more diverse. And we, we live with each other, we know each other. Um, and when you think about there's been research done by the business community, Minnesota historically has been pretty good at attracting, um, for example, um, black workers to come you know, in senior levels in companies, but they don't stay. Uh, a representative of that. I dedicate myself to the kind of work that the league is doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Bigham, please, your last comments. Sure. Um, first, thank you for everybody for organizing for uh, this event, and thank you for everybody who is uh, attending the event to listen to us. Um, obviously, Monday's a very exciting day, um, and it, it's, it always is our first day session, um, even in these tough times. So my one thing I'd like to take away from, for you all to take away from this event is get involved, stay involved, continue to email, call, show up. Um, Tony, Keith, and I are going to have a, a Zoom town hall here uh, in the coming weeks. Attend those, participate in those by submitting questions. Um, this is your democracy, as fragile as it might be at this moment. Um, it's going to get stronger when we're all participating together and have the um, opportunity to do such. So 
thank you and um, look forward to seeing y'all in person next year with some good food from River Oaks uh, Golf Course. Although I will say this, uh, Susan won't be joining us. This is like our, our first of our last Susans. Um, so uh, thank her on behalf of all of us. Uh, thank you for all your service to Woodbury and, and Oakdale and Maplewood and Landfall. So your whole district and as our leader and as a friend. Thank you, such kind words. Um, Representative Jurgens. Well, I just wanna thank the League of Women Voters for host, hosting this today and for the participants that took time out of their Saturday morning to, uh, to join us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, whether it's virtual or in person with uh, uh, my colleagues that are on here as well. Um, and, and as Carla said, the, the, the real work starts on Monday, um, but in this line, it, line of work, it never really stops. Uh, we haven't been in session since June, but um, I think all of us have continued to work on uh, projects and, and, and issues for our constituents and, and work on bills to get ready for the upcoming session. So I would just say, stay tuned and strap in. It's gonna be an interesting few months. Thank you. Um, Representative Jung. Final comments? Well, yes, I, I wanted to thank the League of Women Voters for spending your time, you know, not just today, but all those hours trying to put this together, trying to reach outreach to us, finding our different emails that we that we give to you guys. So I just want to <laughs> thank you all so much and for tracking us down where we're out in the streets to door hockey and trying to get us reminders of that we have special panels coming up. And so I just want to thank you all for your dedication and in your volunteer time. Uh, you guys are what makes, you know, democracy works, right? Participation uh, from our community members. And so I just want to thank you all so much. Uh, please, like what Carla, uh, Carla said, you know, uh, get involved, stay, in, stay involved. Don't just tell us about what you don't like, uh, you know, tell us what you like, what you support. Um, you know, things you wish would happen at the Capitol too. And so uh, we'll always have our doors open for you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our final uh, comments will go to Senator Kent. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. I remember my very first one of these panels and I can't believe this is my last. As a panelist, I'll be back next year in the audience, in person, enjoying the breakfast and the company and our wonderful legislators. Um, you know, I, I, I think Steve and uh, Carla both said some of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, agreed, the League of Women Voters, thank you for everything you do. And um, I look forward to having time to be more engaged in that aspect of the work after I've, I've finished my tenure this year with the Senate. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to represent um, these communities over the past now almost 10 years. Um, but I wanna go back to something Steve said, and I think we all need to hold this in our heart. This has been an incredible, this has been a traumatic couple of years and um, we all need to have grace for each other um, and, and, and think about the way that this has affected so many people, our kids, um, our elders, my 81 year old, very frail mother just got through very mild COVID. She's vaxxed and boosted. Um, and let's just hold that in our hearts as we go through this next session. And, and remember, we need to take care of each other um, and, and get through this and come out hopefully stronger on the other side of it. So thank you all. Jody. Well, um, we wanna thank all of you for being with us. This is my favorite thing. I've always loved doing these legislative interviews. It was my introduction to the League of Women Voters, and I just love it. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all your time, and thank you for all that you do. So now uh, for some final comments, we would like to um, turn it over to our Voter Services Chair, Linda Walling. Good morning. Um, wow. Thank you all to the panelists. This was really a great legislative interview. I think it clearly demonstrates many of the issues that you folks and our other elected officials are facing. And it's also a good reminder that this November will be a major election year. The local league will be holding at least eight candidate forums. And the value of our forums is significantly impacted by the questions asked, as I think most folks would agree about this morning. 
because of that, we will need a number of question screener facilitators to both collect and evaluate the questions. Um, the State League it will be offering training for question facilitators between February and May of this year, and then a few more sessions this summer. It's an excellent opportunity to be involved in a league activity, and we are recommending that all facilitators, first time as well as our more experienced facilitators, consider um, attending the training. Um, and there'll be more information about this in your February newsletter. And now I'd like to turn it over to Betsy, our president, for her final comments. Okay, I decided that all of you will be the ones in charge of our legislature because you know how to work together and you are really such uh, wonderful examples of public servants. And that's what we need in our legislature, public servants. And so thank you, thank you, um, all of you. And um, I just wanna add also my uh, appreciation for all um, your um, guidance and your work, Susan, uh, as our Senator, you have really, um, you know, you've been such a servant these years and uh, we need more um, people that have the same philosophy that you all have demonstrated today. Um, thank you for reaching across the aisles, for working together to being role models, because that's what we what we need to see from all our legislators. Um, as I said, this is our most popular event, uh, but we do have some others coming up in February uh, for our members. We have a member event on February 7th, which is going to look at a um, an overview of a consensus discussion about uh, Let's see, I have to get the right words here. It is um, options for, um, oh, Vivian, it's about dying. It's about options uh, for um, looking at different options for uh, end of life. And uh, it's being brought uh, by the Minneapolis uh, League for us to look at because we'll be taking a, a uh, vote in May when we have our convention. Then we have our program planning meeting on the seventh, at the 14th, which is an opportunity for us to look at what do we want to really focus on from a program standpoint coming up. So it, February is a very important month for us. So I thank you again and um, God bless you for your time starting Monday in our legislature and um, I know you'll represent us well and uh, uh, have a great rest of the weekend. <laughs>